the GI effects stool profile. This presentation will provide you with the basic information as it relates to the results of your GI effects stool profile. As with any great presentation, here are your objectives, outlining what you can expect to learn. First, we must review anatomy and physiology, so when we discuss the components of the profile, you'll have an understanding what area of the gastrointestinal or GI tract we are referring to and its expected function. Explore the features of the GI effects profile and its layout. Lastly, we will review the components of the profile, but as it relates to your specific findings and treatment, please speak with your primary care physician and do not attempt to self-treat. So let's dig on in. The basics of anatomy, which is really structure and organs, and physiology, the function of these organs, of the gastrointestinal tract as it relates to the GI effects stool profile. The GI effects stool profile is organized based on three key functions of gut health arranged in the DIG or DIG format. D for digestion and absorption, I for inflammation and immunology, and G for gastrointestinal microbiome. So let's review anatomy and physiology as it relates to each key function of the gut health, starting off with D, for digestion and absorption. Digestion and absorption, in essence, we are turning food into nutrients to fuel the body. And this can be broken down into four separate steps, ingestion, digestion, absorption, and defecation. So let's look at the diagram and discuss the four steps. Ingestion is the action of eating. Digestion is a combination of mechanical breakdown of food or chewing and chemical breakdown. On average, you should chew your food about 32 times before swallowing because in our saliva, there are actually chemicals that assist in the breakdown of foods. Also to help with digestion, your stomach produces an acid your pancreas produces enzymes released in your small intestines, and your liver makes bile also released into your small intestines. These processes helps to break down the food into smaller pieces. So if you do not chew your food well, or you have a condition where you are not producing enzymes or other digestive chemicals, then you will not be able to break down your food into smaller par particles for the body to actually use. Absorption is the process of moving the nutrients from the gastrointestinal tract into our blood circulatory system to be distributed and used by the body. This happens within the small intestines or the section of the GI tract found after the stomach. So if you have a condition or prior surgery that impacted your ability to absorb your food, then you will have less nutrients for the body to use. Nutrients are basically your vitamins and minerals that are critical for proper function. Lastly, defecation, which is removing waste in the form of a bowel movement, which should occur one to two times daily. If you are not having one to two stools per day, then you are not removing waste from your body very well. The next section is inflammation and immunology. Have you ever accidentally slammed your finger in a door? What do you notice happening first? You know, after the initial shock, your finger turns red, it's hot to touch, it swells or is visibly larger than before, it hurts, and you're not able to move it like you did before you jammed it in the door. These are actually the five signs of acute inflammation, redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function. So as we just reviewed, the first few signs of acute inflammation are redness, heat, and swelling. When it occurs in a GI tract, diagnostic imaging or passing a camera through the mouth or the anus used to diagnose inflammation conditions traditionally shows irritation or redness and swelling. 
Clinically, the client usually experiences pain and even a loss of function, which means your digestion or how you absorb your nutrients and or how you eliminate waste or defecation might be impacted. Immunology or the immune system within your GI tract has a few important functions. Number one, it protects you from the pathogens or bugs that can cause disease. So if a pathogen is present, your immune system mounts an attack to kill and destroy the invaders. Number two, it also helps our body to determine our response to foods. Sometimes our immune system is activated in a bad way, and when we eat certain foods, it can cause headaches, a change in your stool pattern, skin rashes, unusual tiredness or fatigue, abdominal or belly pain, and even gas. If you're concerned with a possible food reaction, you can ask your primary health care physician for follow-up testing to look for food sensitivities. This is very different from a food allergy. A food sensitivity is not potentially life-threatening, but it can sure cause a lot of discomfort. The last section is G for gastrointestinal microbiome. Your gut is home to trillions of microorganisms that are dynamic, or they basically change all the time. They change based on what you eat, where you live, medications you take, the people you live with, and many day-to-day -day activities. The microorganisms consist of bacteria, yeast, and viruses that are beneficial. These organisms do everything from managing your immune system, producing vitamins, extracting energy from your food, to helping control brain health. They play such an important role with health. In fact, many common GI complaints, systemic disease, and poor glucose handling can be linked to the microorganisms that live within our gut. So let's imagine eating an unhealthy diet filled with candy, soda, and fried greasy foods. Again, the microbiome is dynamic and influenced by our diet. So it will change, unfortunately, in an unhealthy manner, potentially leading to gas, bloating, and diarrhea. Because the microorganisms help with all the listed functions above, we may find ourselves getting sick more often, tired because we're not making enough vitamins and getting enough energy from our foods, and we may feel depressed. The great news is that this is still a dynamic community. So we can actually make changes to our diet to improve our microorganisms and our overall health. Now that we have a good foundation of the GI tract as it relates to the GI effects stool profile, let's look at the various features and components of the profile. Remember, every marker we will discuss will fall under either the D for digestion and absorption, I for inflammation and immunology, or the G for gastrointestinal microbiome. Here's the first page of your results. Again, please seek counsel from your primary care clinician regarding your results and treatment options. The top portion or the results overview graphic. We are using a basic color coding system where red represents a need for a high level of support, yellow represents moderate need for support, and green represents low need for support in that particular category. For this sample report, this patient needs a higher level of support for inflammation or the I in DIG and gut microbiome or the G in DIG because these categories are red. A moderate level of support is needed for digestion or the D in DIG because this category is yellow. The next portion of the front page is the functional imbalance scores. Here we give you a number out of 10 that corresponds with a color or the level of need for support in that category. 
the functional score is based on which indicator or biomarker we measured is out of expected or ideal range. If the biomarker is elevated slightly, you'll see a yellow arrow pointing upwards. Or if the biomarker is really, really low, you'll see a red arrow pointing downwards. A green dot means that the biomarker is within the expected or ideal range. The therapeutic support options are static, meaning it is the same for each patient. So based on the measured biomarkers, a healthcare practitioner picks the therapy that corresponds with the biomarker and patient symptoms. Not every time a biomarker is out of range will you require a therapy. Sometimes it may be explained by your diet or supplements medications that you are taking. The commensal microbiome analysis, looking at the commensal abundance, dysbiosis patterns, and commensal balance falls under the G for the gut microbiome in the DIG framework. We evaluate popular microorganisms in the GI tract, specifically bacteria that are called commensal bacteria, meaning that there is a mutually beneficial relationship between two. In this case, there is a beneficial relationship between the bacteria that live in our GI tract and you as the host. We oftentimes will call them beneficial bacteria. There are certain patterns we look for within the commensal or beneficial bacteria that can provide us insight into your health as well as your diet. Because they are dynamic or they change all the time, they can be influenced when our health and or diet is improved. Let's look at the abundance. The abundance is the sum total of the reported commensal bacteria compared to a healthy cohort. In essence, we are comparing you with the healthy cohort to see if you have more or less of the total amount of beneficial bacteria. If you have more, this is called potential microbiome overgrowth. And if you have less, it is called potential microbiome deficiency. The most common reason somebody has a microbiome deficiency is due to an unhealthy diet where they do not eat enough fiber that can be found in vegetables, fruits, and legumes like beans and fermented foods like sauerkraut. If this is the case, then eating more fiber and fermented foods can help to increase the commensal abundance. The most common reason for microbiome overgrowth can be that they eat a great diet or take probiotics. However, having an overgrowth with upper GI symptoms like gas and bloating that gets worse after eating may require further workup to evaluate a condition called small intestine bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. This is a condition which there are too many bacteria in the small intestines and a treatment to address the why and or clear the bacteria can help improve upper GI symptoms. The commensal dysbiosis pattern. Dysbiosis simply means that there is an imbalance in the microorganisms than what we see with a healthy person. Genova Diagnostics has a large amount of information from the stool profiles we have run over the past decade, and that information can show us patterns of the bacteria that are commonly seen in certain diseases or conditions. For the inflammation-associated dysbiosis, IAD, if this number is high, it means that your bacteria imbalance or dysbiosis is similar to those who have an inflammation disease in the GI tract. For the methane dysbiosis score, if this number is high, it means that there is dysbiosis or an imbalance of the bacteria in your GI tract that favor producing methane gas. When produced in a large number, there is a correlation with immune suppression, the presence of harmful bacteria or a parasite, and or overgrowth of the bacteria, also called SIBO. Which zone you fall in 
one, two, three, or four depends both on the IAD, inflammation associated dysbiosis, and the methane dysbiosis score. On the right hand side of the report, it provides you additional information about common patterns we see within each zone and treatment considerations. Lastly, we have the commensal balance. The position of the patient's results against the color-coded gradient, green, yellow, and red, provides a comparison of your commensal bacteria findings to those seen in healthy and unhealthy individuals. Green suggests a balanced commensal health profile. Yellow suggests borderline, and red suggests an imbalance. The x-axis or horizontal axis is the reference variance score. This tells us how many of the beneficial or commensal bacteria are out of range. It will range from 0 to 24. The y-axis or vertical axis is the healthy pattern continuum, which separates healthy and unhealthy patterns. It will range from 0 to 10, with 10 representing a healthy pattern. The bottom of the page is the relative commensal abundance. Hopefully you recall from this term on the top of page two, where we said the abundance compares you with the healthy cohort to see if you have more or less of the total amount of bacteria. Here we are taking a closer look at the phylum level. A phylum groups similar bacteria together. We are showing if you have a microbiome overgrowth or deficiency for that phylum compared to healthy individuals. The right hand side tells you what types of foods influence each phylum. In general, for a healthy abundance, make sure you are eating a good variety of plants, fiber, healthy fats, and complex carbohydrates like beans, whole grains, and vegetables. Here we see the fourth page of the report laid out in the DIG framework. D for digestion and absorption, I for inflammation and immunology, G for gastrointestinal microbiome. So let's look at each section individually. We reviewed earlier that digestion and absorption has four steps, ingestion or eating the food, digestion, breaking down the food, absorption, nutrients moving into circulation, and defecation, removal of waste. The first marker, pancreatic elastase, represents a series of chemicals or enzymes released from your pancreas into your small intestines in the GI tract that helps to break down your foods. If we do not have enough pancreatic enzymes, it will be difficult for our bodies to break the foods down that we eat so we can use them for energy. There are different reasons why the pancreas may not be producing enough enzymes, including chronic pancreatitis, or inflammation of the pancreas, or even autoimmune disease where your body mistakes self as foreign and attacks it. Products of protein breakdown looks at how well you can break your proteins down. Protein comes from animal meats, but also plant proteins like beans and nuts. Protein is important because every cell in your body contains protein, which helps your body to repair and grow. Fecal fats examines if you're breaking down your fats from the foods you eat. Total fecal fats is a combination of triglycerides, long chain fatty acids, cholesterol and phospholipids measured in the stool. Your body uses fats for energy. It helps you to absorb vitamins and it is important for hormone production and keeping you warm. If you have low pancreatic elastase, high protein breakdown or high fecal fat total, this means that you are not breaking down nor absorbing your foods efficiently. Using digestive support with meals may be needed as well as trying to figure out the reason behind poor digestion absorption. If the protein breakdown or fecal fats are low, make sure you are getting enough protein and fat in your diet. The next portion, inflammation and immunology. Both calprotectin and eosinophil protein X are inflammatory markers. If these are elevated, your primary care clinician will either recheck these markers in six to eight weeks or refer you to a gastroenterologist.
gastroenterologist for further evaluation and maybe even imaging to investigate the reason why you have inflammation and the location of the inflammation within your GI tract. Fecal secretory IgA, when elevated, informs us that your immune system is upregulated, meaning your immune system, which protects us from foreign invaders, is on high alert. There are a few reasons this immune marker may be elevated. Number one, the presence of an unfavorable bacteria or yeast. Number two, a food that you are eating in which your immune system is responding poorly to. Or number three, intestinal permeability, sometimes called leaky gut, where the tight junctions that hold your cells together in your intestinal wall become loose and allow large molecules and toxic materials to enter into the bloodstream and leads to inflammation. If there is an unfavorable bacteria or yeast present, your primary care clinician will determine if and how to treat based on your symptoms and other diagnosis that you may have. To help identify if your body is poorly responding to a particular food, your clinician may suggest discontinuing a particular food to see if your symptoms improve. We often call this an elimination diet. Or your primary care clinician can order further testing to identify those foods. For leaky gut, we have to identify why you have this condition in the first place. For example, bad bacteria, certain medications, standard American uh, diet or poor lifestyle, and use vitamins and herbs or botanicals to help support the tight junctions. The last section in the DIG framework, also the largest portion of the test, is the gut microbiome metabolites. Short chain fatty acids are created by good bacteria or commensal bacteria fermenting fiber from the diet. If the short chain fatty acids are low or the percent distribution is skewed, we need to increase fiber and the variety or sources of fiber and support the commensal bacteria with probiotics or fermented foods. Beta-glucuronase is an enzyme that interferes with your body's ability to clear or detoxify hormones, toxins, cancer-causing agents, and medications or drugs. If this enzyme is elevated, make sure you are up to date with all cancer prevention screenings, such as pap smear for women still menstruating, colonoscopy for those 45 and older, and mammograms for women 45 and older. These are rough guidelines when to start screening. However, it may be different based on your family history and personal risk factors for cancers. Your clinician may also recommend a supplement or certain foods like oranges, apples, fiber, green vegetables to help block and or decrease the accumulation of this enzyme. If low, it is often due to low levels of beneficial bacteria and using a probiotic and fermented foods like sauerkraut can be helpful. Still within the gut microbiome section, we are now looking at the 24 commensal or beneficial bacteria measured on this profile. The goal is to is balance on this page. When the commensal bacteria trend low, consuming more vegetables, fiber, fermented foods, and probiotics can be supportive. If the commensal bacteria trend high, this could be a good thing if your diet already contains vegetables and other foods that encourages a healthy and balanced microbiome, or it may be a sign of SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Remember, the dysbiosis column on the front page of the report provides actionable steps to support the commensal bacteria. In addition, we have a chart that discusses diet and lifestyle habits like exercise that supports each measured commensal bacteria. Here we are looking at how certain microorganisms, bacteria and yeast, grow in culture. Using a special culture plate, we report the growth as NG or no growth, or if there was growth in the culture, we quantify it using one plus, two plus, three plus, or four plus designation and a color coding system, non-pathogen NP green, potential pathogen PP yellow, or known pathogen P red. Non-pathogens are normal, commensal flora which have not been recognized as disease causing. 
Potential pathogens are considered opportunistic organisms capable of causing symptoms like diarrhea or stomach cramping, but many people will have no symptoms. Pathogens are organisms that can cause disease. If an organism is present as a potential pathogen or a pathogen and you have GI symptoms, your primary care clinician may decide to use botanicals, a prescription, and or probiotics to treat or clear that bacteria or yeast mycology. On the front page of the report, this is reflected under the infection pillar. Based on what microorganism was identified as a pathogen or a potential pathogen, further testing is done to see what would be helpful to treat this microorganism. If applicable, these results can be found later in the report, but helps to guide your clinician with treatment if they choose to do a botanical herb or a prescription. The next two sections looks at parasites, worms, and other findings in the stool. If present, treatment will depend on your symptoms and current health status. Fecal occult blood looks for microscopic or non-visible amounts of blood in the stool, which may indicate a GI disease and require further investigation. The color and consistency of the stool is from what you reported on the form or questionnaire you sent back to the laboratory. And this brings us to the end of your report. I want to thank you for your time and attention. If you have questions about treatment or interpretation of your results, please consult with your healthcare practitioner. If you do not have a healthcare practitioner, you can find one through your insurance company or using our website under the patient portal, select the option to find a doctor. Again, thank you.